Welcome to Being the Genuine Athlete podcast, where we inspire those who aim for excellence in life and want to understand the how and what it takes to be a champion in life. My name is Jura Koschak. My purpose, dedication and commitment is to activate your potential, that you understand the ego through your sport and life situations. So I share and give you the tools to be just this, the genuine athlete. Are you ready to tune in? Hello, Mr. Bill. Bill Patton, uh, I'm very honored on hosting you on my podcast, Being the Genuine Athlete. Thank you very much. It's great to be here, Yuri. Um, I, I'm uh, really happy about how quickly we put this together and how open you are to having a discussion with almost a complete stranger. Well, we will get to know ourselves. Uh, in, in, in this conversation, I'm just putting the story on. So, uh, Mr. Bill is a very good, uh, actually, uh, professional tennis coach. You worked with a lot of tennis players. Uh, you have a, more than 30 years of experience, and you've written, you are also an author of 11 books, mainly about tennis, and you're the founder of USA Tennis Coach and USPTA Elite, and some other. Uh, credentials that you have you might add so that you present yourself please yeah well I, I see that you're reading off of a bio that I wrote somewhere and I think I need yeah. to update that so okay. please uh, okay. yeah I'm, I, I'm formerly a USPTA elite pro but uh, and USTA, USA tennis coach is not something that's really happening right now but but right now uh, probably the number one thing that I'm looking forward to is launching an online course called Visual Training for Tennis. And then I think another thing that might appeal to your audience in general is uh, I've written a book called The Athlete-Centered Coach. So I think we're gonna touch a lot on those things, but yes, I've been teaching tennis for 30 years and coached you know, champion teams and, and coached a lot of beginner players and intermediates and you know, everywhere in between, you know, up to about a, 6.0 level player that's about the highest level player that i've ever coached is about that level i'm not sure what that translate exactly to in the utr but um uh so it's a pretty strong level of play but you know I, I can't claim that i've coached you know lots of tour players or whatnot so that's just not not part of my resume okay no, no problem any coach yeah. any I had, a I had a short career of being a coach in table tennis. Otherwise, uh, I was a professional table tennis player. And I went through all of this, as you mentioned now, regarding uh, athlete-centered coach. Uh, we can just dive right into it. Uh, what does this mean? What does it entail? Or what do you actually want to uh, bring out with this? Yeah, well, I think there are a couple of different things that that come to the fore when you're talking about an athlete centered coach, as opposed to um, just a regular coach, because, because most coaches uh, I do believe operate a certain way. Um, but the athlete centered coach sees themselves as being a part of the player's timeline of their lives rather than the player comes and joins the coach's timeline. How am I helping them? How does this player fit into me achieving my own personal glory? Um, and then a, an athlete-centered coach is really more of a whole list. What's developmentally appropriate now at this age? How do you deal with things like injury, relationship, the other things that come up that are not the strokes, that are not the X's and O's or strategies of how to play? They're the, the soft science, so to speak. So there's a lot of that. Like for instance, um, I think an athlete-centered coach helps create an ethic won't be tempted to take performance-enhancing drugs because because I think an athlete-centered coach realizes that you know the long the long-term health and happiness and safety of the player is that they do things in an all-natural way. Uh, because I think we know that there are a lot of negative outcomes with training inappropriately too young of an age, uh, with um, 
from putting an inordinate amount of pressure on a kid to be a performer so that then they can feed their family later? Uh, great. So regarding athlete-centered coach is where my, in a way, not to, maybe mission and a purpose is to inspire, to activate a lot of athletes to become genuine. But what I mean by that with this authenticity, to understand who you are, because a lot of like people in general, we do not know ourselves. We just follow some egoistic goal or something that was, you know, imprinted on us from environment or ourselves. And then we just follow this and we lose the touch with reality. As you mentioned, uh, the, uh, drug enhancements uh, come, come in, uh, coaches, parents, and this is all a, a vicious circle that keeps on going, um, feeding itself off on the ego way. Uh, so this is where I come in with this purpose and this mission to actually activate athletes to become more uh, authentic and genuine in understanding who you are. That doesn't mean that you take away the goals, but that you understand who you are. It's like not everybody is an apple and not everything is a banana. So it's different things that you need to understand. Can you please, yeah. Yeah. Can you please elaborate this uh, regarding tennis and how you maybe uh, see a player or how you talk to them or what was your experience when you received the player who was like thinking that yes. they are something but they were something else? Great comments, great question. Uh, in fact, while you were talking, I, was, I started getting a story coming into my mind a, a certain yeah. player popped into my head so i think i think this story is going to answer a lot of that so so i got a phone call from a parent and you know the, the she's telling me about how frustrated she is because the daughter wants to play tennis the parents are divorced the dad is extremely high pressure with his daughter she's She's, a, she's got some talent. His, his mentality is that she has to get a Division I scholarship in the United States or, or it's failure. Anything less than a Division I scholarship is considered failure in his eyes. So now she's sort of taken on this pressure. And the other problem was she couldn't fight her way out of a paper bag. She, she was losing matches that were very winnable and just couldn't seem to win a match, had almost no confidence in herself to play like she can play in a match. So enter Coach Patton to this situation, right? So, so the first thing is I, I want to talk to this girl, right? So... So, you know, I, I listened to the mom for a long, long time. We talked. I said, you know, I, I will dig in and we will figure out what's going on with her. And, and she, during this time, she will either decide to go all in in the direction she wants to go or she may end up stop playing tennis. That's what could happen. So I'm not, I can't promise you what's going to happen here. Mm -hmm. but. I will dig into it. Anyway, so so I started asking the girl. I'm like, okay, so I'm I'm hitting with her and she's got a, she's got power, she's got control, she's got, you know, there's some flaws in her game, so she makes too many errors. So the first thing I did is I kind of showed her some things where she could control the ball three, four lessons held it in. And then I went with her to a tournament um, where she won her first match in months or maybe a year or over a year. That's how, that's how bad her losing streak was. So, so during this time, you know, a little bit. So I went to this tournament. She ended up going to the finals and losing in the finals, but it was a big confidence booster for her. And then we, then you know, we worked on her game a little bit more. And then, and then finally, I said, okay, now where do you really want to go? What do you want to do here? Because um, you know, she says, oh well, she says, my dad thinks I need to, you know, get a Division One scholarship. 
And I'm like, okay, that's fine. But what do you want? And she's and she didn't know. She didn't know what she wanted. Her her father had sort of snuffed out her her own thinking about her own self and what she wanted to do in life. His pressures, his his goals, his uh tunnel vision um created an atmosphere where she was not free to speak about what she thought and felt so in the in the training then a lot of what i do is i ask my players okay why did you miss that shot and when they haven't been trained to think for themselves they they answer the question why how I'm like, no, 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 wait, no, I'm asking you to think about why did you just miss that shot? You have to stop and think and you have to answer me and you might be guessing. So, oh, because I took too big of a backswing. I'm like, okay, yes, but why did you take too big of a backswing? Oh, because I think I felt like I needed more power on the shot. I'm like, okay, well now look at where you are on the court. In this part of the court, do you need that much power? Oh, maybe I don't. Right. So creating this situation where now she becomes her own expert and I'm just the guide because I think I know where I want she, where she wants to go. So, you know, I, I like how you were talking about authenticity because ultimately it's the players who have to play the game and they have to know their game and they have to know what makes them perform well and what doesn't make them perform well. And they have to manage it because in, in very few competitive situations is coaching allowed. And even if it is, it's not a lot of time to get that done. So tennis is so amazing, as you know, and probably ping pong's the same way, or I'm sorry, table tennis, oops. Uh, table tennis is, it's an independent situation of having to problem solve so so anyway as it turned out so we worked together for about a year and a half two years and it was very friendly and and then this young lady went off and found a really small liberal arts school that played division two and she might have gotten a little bit of money but she was just really happy to be able to go play division two college tennis at a school that was a great fit for her academically. Because then what she also began to discover after a you know, lot of discussion, we talked about it a lot, is what do you really want out of college? And it turned out she wanted to go to a smaller school where she could make closer friends and she could also stand out among her peers instead of being lost in a sea of people at a school that has 40,000 students. So a lot of great things were achieved there. Um, did she become a world champion or even a national champion? No, but, but she had tremendously positive outcomes, whereas it looked like he was very close to where she could quit the sport, possibly. Great answer. Thank you for sharing this Thank story. Thank you. Uh, it's a great story, and this is the the placement, the authenticity, genuinity, genuineness is like the placement. You place yourself, but by according what you know, how you expand your broad horizon of uh, intelligence, not just, uh, not just intelligent quotient, but also emotionally, mentally, how you can adapt. And this is lost with all this instant gratification life that young people live now. Uh, I was born in the 19, 1982. I presume that you are a bit uh, earlier. Uh, uh, a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. So uh, this instant <laughs> gratification now with all the likes and all the you know things that we need to achieve instantly takes away a lot of this working, going through, okay. enjoying so, in the process. Yes and no. Yes and no. I, I, this is one of my... One of my favorite things is to d discuss this sort of generational, you know, phenomenon stuff. But kids are still kids. So when a five-year-old falls down on, and scrapes their knee, they cry, right? When 
teenagers are self-conscious and they've always been self-conscious, right? They, so there's some things that are universal. Like, I mean, we used to have telephones that were wired to the wall, but people still got their instant gratification on the telephone that was wired to the wall, right? So while there's more conveniences and there are greater percentages of people who act a certain way, there are also a lot of universals that there's nothing new under the sun, you know? Teenagers are still teenagers. So, um, you know, in every generation has their own thing that they present. And so I, I saw an interesting book that showed, that showed how generations are cyclical and that, that first you get, you know, very, you, you get one wave of a generation and then it's followed by another wave followed by another wave followed by another wave and it's like a cycle of i think five or six generations and then it repeats it starts over again one of one of these waves invariably leads to the next kind of wave leads to the next one but then you have people who are outliers from their generation so i mean i i feel like i have a lot of traits that would be, I mean, I'm, I'm a, the very end of the baby boomer, but I have a lot of very strong generation X traits to me, even though I'm technically a baby boomer, right? I mean, I, it was a lot of my peers who, who would dream up things like, hey, there should be an Olympics where you do crazy ski jumping and stuff like that, and right? There should be an Olympics of skateboarding and and you know uh and, and uh, what's the word for yeah snowboarding and right and so now that happened but you know so it was the, sometimes the dreamers of a previous generation are the visionaries who lead who create the thought base for things to move forward from there so it's already get so deeply philosophical, but kids are still kids. And I, there's so many things that are universally always true. I, I prefer to work with them in that way. And I, I think those of uh, these other, the fascination with generational shifts is interesting, but not essential. But uh, you mentioned now, what can we, what is your experience and what can you say about universally what is the stopping force what is stopping these athletes that you've encountered in your experience so emotions some mental disbeliefs certain beliefs what can you tap into or what what was the Se most out self doubt self doubt i mean almost so i i wrote a book called playing sports right your way and in one of the chapters i had had some of my adult friends write a note to their 11 year old self if you could go back and talk to your 11 year old self what would you say and very commonly they said you're better than you think you are that's that was probably the most important moment important to foster big dreams in in kids and then um and then when the time is right then sh show them that yes indeed um you might not be as good as that person right there so what does that mean it means you're going to have to improve because you, if you want to beat them you're going to have to get better and then a little bit later maybe after puberty then it's time to really work hard as soon as puberty hits for a kid, it's time to work really hard because now all of a sudden your body has shifted towards you know adulthood and and that's when you want to max it out and and get as much out of that frame that you can. So I had an interesting experience with studying um, to write a master's degree and there was a piece of literature that did not fit with what I was doing but I became engrossed with it anyway and it was about at-risk 
children. And so uh, the research seemed to suggest that when children are ages four to 10, that it's healthy for them to have grandiose visions about being the best in the world at something, anything. So for a tennis coach, I mean, all of your four to 10 year olds ought to be dreaming, I hope, of being number one in the world at tennis. But if not that, then maybe the number one, maybe they're going to be a superstar singer, actress, right? Astronaut, president of the United States or whatever it is, something to be the best. And that's very healthy. Children who are already realistic thinkers between the ages of four and 10 are already at risk. And it's extremely misguided parenting to try to instill realism. You have to be realistic and or um, hard work. You have to work hard before the age of 10. Because what does it mean? It doesn't mean anything. It, most kids be under the age of 10 don't even compare themselves to other children yet. Their brains don't do that. It's all about them. They think they're the only person on the planet that matters. So then if a child is pessimistic between the ages of four and 10, it will take some serious intervention in their lives to help them um, not to be an at-risk teenager, right? And then, then something happens, and it might happen at 10 or 11, and it may be happening sooner now with social media, um, but kids in, in 11 to 13 years old start to socially compare. They start to see that Steve has a better serve than John, who has a better serve than them. So there are people out there better than me. Right. And there are people who are worse. Um, and so the social comparison is a great time to, to start the conversation of the fact that, yes, there's a tremendous amount of competition in the world. So which so ne so now realism comes into it. So some amount of realism comes in at age 11. So that just means stick with it. Don't stop. Keep going. And then, like you know, I mentioned earlier, you know that that then um, then once you get to a point where your body and your mind are more ready and sturdy and and supported to work really hard, then then the message of hard work comes. So it's really most of the work for people who are going to become great great athletes starts to happen around 13, 12, 13 something like that and you know with with tennis one thing that i hear quite often is that if someone's going to be a uh, a very you know maybe a professional or division one level athlete you're going to want to start to see some very strong results around age 13 14. they should be competing well at a national level um, because you, you'll start to see them emerge physically which doesn't mean that there can't be outliers who maybe started a little late and made up for it by working even harder later. I mean, it's, I think, you know, there's still some kids who can make up lost time, if, especially if they grew late, you know, from like 16 to even 19 or, or as late as 20 years old. So that's, so that, that speaks a lot to the developmental appropriateness of the messaging to the kids and, and you know, having dreams, having, being realistic while retaining your dreams, and then working really hard and keeping the dream alive. Thank you. It's so great that you've um, covered now this pyramid in a way, the fundament, the imagination that is so important. Uh, I had big problems with this. Maybe I was at risk because I was too soon, too realistic. And I felt that uh, when, you, when you spoke now, because life is anyway drama. We don't need to add drama. Life is anyway <laughs> realistic. We don't need to add that shit. Uh, <laughs> like add, add. 
It's over. It, it comes realistic, as you said. Right. Once you turn 11, 12, it's overdose of drama, realism, hormones, puberty, all the stuff comes. So just let children be children, and that's so great. Uh, yes. I have, yeah. I have two questions now uh, that we connect. Uh, one question, actually, in, in, in two questions in one. So two in one. Uh, you, we've mentioned now the self-doubt and uh, covered it a bit. The shift, you also mentioned already uh, about the shift, how it happens really with imagination, uh, hard work, dedication. Uh, but now is this post-quarantine. We are still in a crazy 2020 year. Uh, I've been listening for this 2020 since 10 years ago, that it's going to be a crazy year. I don't know who said it. Some psychic uh, ability person told me about 2020 uh, from time, time traveler. But we are here. Uh, uh, but anyway, uh, what uh, my girlfriend now as a tennis coach is experiencing and around the world is what a lot of athletes, professional athletes, have been experiencing after injury, after rehab. So now the whole world was like injured. They were all like stripped wow. of in, com in competition. So the shift yeah. of self-doubting, the shift, how does this shift happen from what's stopping you that you transform and shift towards, you know, being able to have that confidence in spite of the injury or this quarantine that was like really taken? Yeah, big question. That's an enormous question, but I'll take a poke at it. And I do believe that you could ask 50 people. <laughs> and after asking 50 people, you might be able to pull it all together and say, okay, I think I understand something. So I'll take a shot at it. So if we, so um, one of the universals of, of all great athletes is that they have to overcome some kind of adversity in their life. So whether it's an injury or the loss of a parent or, or some other, or, or, or a, a loss that means not qualifying for some, you know, training or, you know, whatever it is, a setback that means that your path is altered. Um, it's part, it's, it's what happens. So yeah. I think the first thing is just to say, this is normal. This is normal. So don't, don't make excuses for it. Just say, well, the good news is everybody's experiencing this. The people who are probably the most positively affected by this are people who were already injured and now they, now all competition is stopped. So they get to rehab and there'll be no negative net effect on their ranking. Roger Federer is the most blessed person because he now gets to come back from his knee injury. Okay. So, so yeah, I mean, adversity is a blessing, not a curse. It's, it's something that has to be overcome because in order for someone to become a champion at something, then they're going to have to beat all the competition and that's an adversity itself. So, because they're all trying really hard to become as ver adverse as possible to you. So, um, so yeah, take it philosophically. Instead of, instead of dwelling on the loss, uh, consider what can be gained from that. Um, and, uh, you know, take the time. I mean, hopefully it's, it's getting a little bit late in all of this. I, I, I personally believe that we're very near the end and I don't believe that that a second wave is something that is going to have the same impact. That's and so uh, hopefully that doesn't make you turn off your TV set like right now. But um, but, you know, be be ready for a possible second wave. I don't know. I mean, I, I can't answer that, but. Plan as though there's going to be now an opening and be ready to do that. Now, hopefully some people have already done the work of saying, all right, well, everything has stopped. So what am I going to do? So it's a great time for me to work on my mental game, read some books, you know, get, you know, really uh, clean out my mind and fill my mind with principles that are going to help me moving forward and, you know, take advantage of all the other 
opportunities that have arisen because of the stoppage. So um, those that have done that work are going to benefit dramatically from having done that. Those that just sort of sat around and cried and were bored and played video games the whole time, they're gonna they're gonna wish they hadn't. So did I cut? Did I get dig deeply into enough into that? Is there more that you want on that? No, it's uh, quite enough uh, regarding adversity and life. Life happens. Life is not what we have a scenario especially an ego scenario and i always say with my clients and with myself if you cry after the loss it's okay or if you are disappointed devastated but you are not crying or you are not devastated because you lost you lost because you have devastation and anger in you so take out the trash clean the mental side clean the basics the fundamentals and the life is adversity okay Every Girl boy is in tears because that's deep caring about the outcome of the match right now obviously you have to take that and you have to you have to work with that and turn that into a different kind of energy but i i don't i can't remember the last time i i saw an eight-year-old boy crying and then they didn't later turn out to be some fantastic competitor so regarding the what i mentioned uh, maybe i was touching more the high performance athletes not so much the developing uh, the periods of, of an athlete uh, regarding crying or regarding some anger emotions that's what i wanted to clarify but otherwise yes uh, it's it's normal emotions normal things and that is life uh, in a way it's in itself yeah well if we if, if we you want to shift it to high performance then for a moment uh, Maybe we can touch because it is it yeah. is a difference uh, between developing to towards and then it's self professionalism. Well, yeah, I mean, so so for instance, you know, a, a high performance athlete then um, taking advantage of this time would be searching for a for a place that's remote enough that has a facility where you can actually train to a high level. So. I mean, like, for instance, for a tennis player, if you can find a private house that has a tennis court where you can train, then you, then you need to do that. So exhausting all resources uh, to get that done is important. And, and then that brings us to fitness because, you know, it's, it, is a, what, it has been an amazing opportunity to become incredibly fit. And that's maybe the thing that has changed the most in t in most sports is the science behind ultimate fitness uh that we've seen that has you know made athletes bigger stronger faster made ball speeds greater and and all of those things so it's pretty awe-inspiring the detail that's gone into uh you know, planning the training table of what they eat uh, through to the precise, the price sports specific workouts, and then also the mental training. Because now, I mean, I remember when sports psychology was not really accepted as a practice. It was kind of like this, it was a witch doctor thing. And, yeah. and people that practice sports psychology, there must be, be something wrong with them yeah yeah so you know there's so many different facets i mean you can work on your body and your mind and you can you can even tap in spiritually because another thing i get into in in athlete centered coach is that most of the best athletes that i've coached have some kind of ethic you know they might be a christian or a muslim or or Buddhist, or they might be a very humanistic, right, person who believes in the human spirit, but they have some kind of ethic that is an underpinning, you know, that creates this basis for their success. So tapping into the spiritual side, I think is something that's also happening more and more with people. Um, and I always encourage that. Can we clarify as well this? A lot of athletes, now when quarantine was happening, 
they were like, I don't have competition now. I don't know when it's going to be, so I am not motivated. So it has shown a lot. A lot of it has come to the surface that they were, they were motivated when they had competition, where they had something to train for. Well, who are you without the training now? Who are you without the competition? That's really interesting. So I think people who could speak to that and, and help other athletes who have a sort of a steady stream of competition could be like Olympic athletes who, you know, what do they have? They have maybe an annual world championship and an every four years Olympics, right? And they might have a couple of national championships in there somewhere or some regional competitions, but it's pretty spare in terms of actual meaningful competitions. So I would say it would be great to get together with um, somebody who's used to this very long training um, uh, regimen with very few, very extremely important competitions along, along the lines. I mean, we're spoiled with tennis with having four grand slams. I mean, that's, uh, that's kind of an amazing thing, four big championships a year. Most sports only have one or one every two years or one every four years. Yeah, Olympics so, and tennis is like something disturbing in between. Why do we have Olympics, <laughs> maybe? So in yeah. other sports, is like different. Yeah, it's a preparation to go to Olympics. Yeah, okay, yes, we can, we can touch the, as well the visual. Uh, do you mean that by visualization or something else? It's, no, it's the actual seeing the ball. Okay, um, yeah. But... Now, here, that's a, that's a good question, a good clarification. So visualization is actually a great thing to help vision. So visual ability is enhanced by visualization. But no, I mean, in terms of, you know, how, you, how you're seeing the ball, there are certain finite things, you know, like reaction time. So, I mean, you you're never going to be able to react to something in less than four one hundredths of a second because there's just hardwired into us a delay between the time we see something and then how long it takes to travel through our brains and then for the signal to be sent to react. So, so there's a finite amount of that. Visualization can help train those responses. It can help. It can help train being able to make the decision quicker because because you, you say to yourself, "Okay, if I see this, then I'm going to do that." Post already a video on on Instagram on I, uh, Instagram TV regarding visualization. I use a very like a cardboard paper, and it's like an empty brain or like a blank brain page. But when you visualize something, it's like first time. When you fold it, it takes time. So mm. it's like visualizing playing a game or doing a certain stroke. Or uh, when my girlfriend is do, giving classes to children, um, I see how tennis coaches, like a lot of times just show, they show. But maybe it would be appropriate also, and I think that you also do that, uh, tell, uh, tell this player, I'm doing this, it's really hard. Uh, tell a player to visualize, to close eyes, maybe visualize on the training court, on the tennis court to visualize and then. Yes. Yeah. So you see, I, I needed a couple of good seconds, 30 seconds. So now I open it. I've done it once. So now how yeah. I do it, see. It's uh, yeah, no, that's, that's a, I think that's a really great uh, visualization of that. That's like you I'm put, yeah, I'm you put the, the brain, you train your brain so that it's, uh, the pathways are getting stronger. Uh, this is scientifically as well. Jordi Spencer and other uh, doctor scientists of these things of how our brain functions yeah. and neurologically, plastic plasticity of the brain. Uh, and this is so important. I've had this when I was playing table tennis uh, or when I was studying sport. Uh, I did a couple of gymnastics uh, like on that uh, two-sided uh, two bars and on one bar you needed to do an exam and I did majority of my ex exercise in my mind, the visualization, because yeah. 
I couldn't have imagined myself like physically. I was a table tennis player. I'm not a gymnast. I didn't have the muscles to be a gymnast. And especially I was afraid to get injured. I was still competing with, I was when, when I was doing that in gymnastics in 20, 21 years of age. So I was so keen on visualizing every evening those elements and that I came the next morning on the exam and I needed to perform a couple of elements connected. I did it like that because I already visualized it. And as well in the table tennis, I had so many problems with some strokes or with some movement. But when I visualized it, as you've mentioned now, this part is the fundament. And then you go into the physical world of vision. Yeah, I don't usually start with uh, visualization as the first topic of, of seeing. Um, I, you know, it's usually something later. But, you know, when, I, when we first get out on a tennis court, now, uh, actually, let me back up for a second. Um, probably the, the biggest issues uh, with vision come for a beginner who's first on the court. And, and then... Secondly, uh, the next biggest issue is people who get trapped at a 4-0 level and below because once you get to 4-5, the ball starts traveling faster and with a lot more varied spins. So, so tracking all of that becomes much more difficult. And so those, those people who's, who learned how to steam the ball but maybe didn't learn the most efficient way they get lost. They, they get trapped at a 4-0 or a 3-5 level because, because their eye skills are missing. They didn't really learn to, to see the ball as well as they could. And I believe that um, you know, maybe 50% of beginners uh, are going to drop out of tennis because they aren't initially taught some eye vision skills. So... Uh, so they that's a not. that's a big that's can a big you please, piece. Can you please repeat it. They are not taught they because they are not taught yeah. Yeah. visual skills first. Mm -hmm. So um, you know part of, part of the issue there is that when a beginner first comes onto the court, they're in an anxious state, and so that means that everything seems fast to them, and they're worried about. They're worried about making a mistake and looking less intelligent than the others, right? About, or less coordinated or, or what, what about have the you. depth? What about the depth vision? Because as I have experienced when I'm helping my girlfriend in a tennis class with children under, under 10 of age, yeah. the depth, they cannot see the depth of the ball. If it's short, long, high, they, they don't move. The vision is not connected with the movement that what it's a, no it's a great point and that that's exactly why we would never want to start someone from the baseline and hit them balls from the other side because because a lot of them will fail with the with the depth perception if presented with that immediately so the first thing the first thing i do when i get people on the court is i'll get them on the other side of the net well i have them touch the net take two steps back only, and we'll toss the ball underhand back and forth. And that achieves a couple different things. It's very easy. It's relaxing and soothing. You can start to de detect if they have some kind of tension and just go, hey, you know what, just relax, take it easy. We're just, you know, we're doing this because it's easy. You know, and then when they successfully do 10 back and forth, then you can move back and you can use the racket, and now let's just have a little, little dinky little rally for a moment. Um, and then see the challenge to the eyes is not that great. And because you're really up close with your student, you can get a really good idea of what is their state of mind at that moment. And, you know, I would say 20% of my students, we quickly move back and, and we'll rally some in the short court. But 80% of them, we're gonna spend 10, maybe even 10 full minutes doing this little tiny little rally very up close to the net until they can learn to go very small with the racket and keep it under control. 
And then once we've successfully done a 10 shot rally, now they have experienced success, right? And we rally. And this is, this is what about easily 80% of all people want when they come onto a tennis court for the first time. They want to successfully rally. Now we can move back a little bit more and to all the way to the service line and take it from there. And once they can rally from there, then they feel like they're really on their way to becoming a tennis player. But so, does, this, does this visual, once you acquire this uh, ability, does this last like, because you're mentioning now the, by the levels, how you advance, how you upgrade the, the okay, also a great question. And, I, and, and that gives me a chance to go back and fill in something I didn't say earlier. But, you know, when, I'm, when people are struggling, what I will often do is say, see the ball come out of my hand. Because they might not be paying attention to my hand, right? And then once we step back, then I say, see the ball come out of my strings and track it into your, to get the ball right in the middle of their strings if they're seeing the ball come out of your racket, right? So, so you know, and I, I like the word seeing. Seeing is sort of passive. You know, watching or keep your eye on the ball, those are sort of tense and sort of willful words, you know? So I, I try to keep the... I try to keep the language that I use around vision as, as being relaxing and passive. You know, and then I, I you know, I, the other thing I do is I say, look, catch the ball on your strings and let your racket toss the ball over, you know, which is a completely different feeling than stroking or hitting the ball. So, so then from there, I mean, the, we, can, we can go a more deeply into visual skills, but when you said, is it, the question, like, is it permanent? Well, the answer is no. And sometimes what happens is you have to regress. You have to go back to a certain skill and rebuild that and then go forward. And so there's some regression and progression that happens. And every once in a while, especially with kids, you know, I, I, I will say, Hey, look, whose job is it to see the ball coming out of my racket? And they go, mine, right? And I'm like, yes. So how many, thing, how many more times do you think I want to tell you that? None? Right. Okay, because your parents pay for this, so you're expected to learn it. I mean, do you not want to do this? So, you know, every once in a while, I kind of have to tease them a little bit in order to make them realize that I do expect them to perform these fundamental visual skills that we shouldn't keep regressing often. But on the other hand, I mean, regression is a part of learning and, and people do it and you have to be ready to support that. You can't always go forward. Sometimes you have to go backwards and reteach. Uh, before we wrap up, uh, I have a question here. When you were speaking now very technically, very um, clean regarding these steps and how it works uh, by experience that I have from table tennis and now from tennis is that a player has a lot in their mind, a lot of, non <laughs> yeah. a lot of nonsense, something uh, yeah. that is completely not needed when you yep. say, I like that you said, mentioned before when you were talking about at-risk children, that you said messaging. Messaging is really important and every word is a message that is imprinted and what you repeat even more. But athletes, players come to the court or even when they are also high professionals, there's so much nonsense. It's actually hit the ball. Yes, it's movement, you need to learn some stuff, but there are players and people that, can, that learn really good, but they still have a lot of nonsense. How do you deal with this? How do you cut away the non essential. Uh, all right. How much longer do we have? Because this is going to be a big answer. Take your time. Not a problem. Okay. All right. I appreciate that. All right. Now, so yeah, because this is like a full on lecture. Let me think. I, I'm, I'm thinking, how am I going to cut this back a little bit? All right. Now, a lot of people are familiar with the concept of learning styles. Okay. So um, 
visual kinesthetic, you know, and, and, and there's many different learning styles. I think there's like 49 or something like that. There's this thing called Bloom's taxonomy. So, um, so that's homework for people watching this. Go look up, go on Pinterest and look up Bloom's taxonomy. Yeah, that's a nice cat. He's fr yeah, friendly guy. I, I can't yeah. grab my cat yet. But anyway, look up Bloom's taxonomy on Pinterest because then you'll find a really nice infographic and you might find it useful. All right now, uh, but the, the problem there is that uh, learning styles come from something called multiple intelligences that was a creation, which is a theory actually of Dr. Howard Gardner from Harvard. And he was actually angry about the oversimplification of multiple intelligences into learning styles, right? So I don't, I don't use learning styles when I'm teaching at all. I use multiple intelligences. Let me, I'll give you an example, all right? So there's, there's intrapersonal learning, there's interpersonal, there's environmental, there's musical, rhythmical, and a few others, right? Environmental, okay, so there are these, so, and, and spatial, right? Visual is also spatial. When your brain is doing something, and there's some, there's one study I've heard of that says this, so I don't know if you, we should take this as gospel, but it sounds good, is that when your brain is engaged in a certain activity, blood flow increases to that part of your brain that you're using, right? So if you are a very verbal person and you're talking all the time, then the blood flow is in the place that does the talking and maybe the listening, maybe just the talking. But anyway, so, but tennis and a lot of sports skills are really learned visually and kinesthetically. That would be, you know, the feeling of yourself in space, right, moving. So the pairing of those two is far more important than anything else. So those people who have a lot of junk going on, the reason is because they're using the wrong modality. So the way to get them to stop doing that is to ask them questions like, do you, are, do you have a checklist in your mind of things that you're thinking about that you have to perform, right? So are you thinking ready position, racket back, back swing, contact point, fall through, finish? Are you, are you listing these things in your mind as you're trying to hit the ball? Because there's no time for that. By the time you think of the first one, the ball's gone. So you get some of those people. And then you have other people who are so analytical. They're so analytical, they have such a great mathematical mind that they're trying to calculate things on the fly, right? And then after they miss a shot, then they're trying to analyze the miss, right? Which, and, and then you have other people who are filled with subjective judgments about everything. Good shot, bad shot. Oh, I hit a good shot, now I'm excited. Oh, now I hit a bad shot. How come I can't hit two good shots in a row? What's wrong with me? And they've got this internal dialogue going on. So, so to eliminate all of that, I always tell people, look, just come back to seeing the ball, right? And feeling it in your racket. Um, and there are three different skills to vision uh, that work really well. And those are scanning, tracking, and focusing. So you scan the ball, and you're seeing it come out of the opponent's racket, right? And then you track it, and it's like this blur across your peripheral vision. And let me define peripheral vision for a moment, because you have a three degree. If you take your thumb and put it out in front of your face that far, take your thumb out there. Okay, please do this. Okay, good. So where your thumb is, that's how wide the area is that you can truly focus. Everything outside of that is in your periphery. 
Okay, so peripheral vision is everything except for that three degrees in front of you that you can focus on. So now, so you're gonna track the ball across your vision, and then finally from the bounce onward, then you're going to, you can focus on it into your strings. And I don't wanna get in, into too much detail on that, but there are a couple other issues that people need to know in regard to cross dextral and pure dextral, but, but that's a side issue. Okay, now, so, so those are the visual skills. And, and if you get people just focused on, on paying attention to what they see and pairing it to what they feel, and this is where then you can say, all right, well, where do the feeling part, the kinesthetic part is, show me where the ball went in your racket. Because they ought to be able to start feeling that or being aware of how the ball came in. Right, and then you can get into, well, did your thumb go over your shoulders? One of my big new things is thumbs over the shoulder, right, for beginners. And then, you know, we get into, okay, well, it can go here and there, and, you know, it, it can finish in different places, but, but the first thing we wanna do is get thumb over the shoulder, um, or as long as it's traveling in that arc. So then we, we talk about that. Did your, did your racket continue to travel in that arc or not? Right? What did you see? What did you feel? Did you see it? Did you feel it? What, what, when you hit a good shot, what do you remember the most? Do you remember most how it looked or how it felt? And about half people remember how it looked and about half the people remember how it felt. And so that gives you a clue. Maybe that's their preferred modality. But whatever their preferred one is, they still have to learn to do the other one. They've got to be able to pair the vision with the feeling to ultimately get it. So, so it's not about identifying what somebody's favorite modality is and then leaving them alone. It's using that, bridging that gap, and then saying, all right, now let's build this other modality but then also let's get you out of the analytical modality. Let's get you out of the verbal modality. Let's get you out of the other one. Now, musical, rhythmical can be a good one because there's a certain rhythm to a tennis shot. Now, every once in a while, you might find that you have a musical, rhythmical learner on your court. So then you might actually start talking in a different way that has a little bit more rhythm to it. And now they can hear what you're saying. So, I mean, every once in a while, right? So you see what I just did right there? So you can, you can clue into these things. And then you, so you might meet somebody who's so, is, is a slow verbal processor. So if you're speaking at all, they just can't see anything. So with those people, I, I tend not, I tend to just speak very minimally and I just repeatedly will show them I'll show them the stroke and then I will, I, will, I will move their stroke for them so they can feel it. And then that's how they're gonna learn it, not from anything I say. So there are a lot of different ways to attack that, but get creative. And it's a really good idea to ask people what's going on. What, I see that you're thinking about something. What is it? And then after a while, you start to learn how to read people's face. You start to be able to see, when you see the smoke coming out their ears, right? Then you know the gears inside are grinding. And then you go, okay, when, when I see this look, I mean, that's a look of frustration. Are you frustrated? What are you frustrated about? Oh, because every time I make one shot good, then I make the next shot bad. I'm like, well, then maybe you should drop the subjective judgments. So, yeah, that, that was kind of a long stream of consciousness thing. Cool, great, great answer. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, as you've asked on Facebook that you want to be a guest on some podcast, do you have a specific message you want to share with these uh, guest appearances of you? Yeah, I mean, I, right now I'm trying to focus more on visual training for tennis. So if you want to have me, you know, if you're watching this and you have a podcast and you want to have me on, I would love to talk visual tennis. But, you know, I also do really love talking about athlete-centered coaching. So athlete-centered coaching, um, you know, 
I would say it's really good to be mindful of realizing um, and, and enacting everything you do as being a part of the player's timeline. And if you're, and we all have these traces of being selfish and wanting it our way. And I, I will never be free of that. I will never be a perfect athlete centered coach, but every once in a while I notice myself, I'm like, okay, yeah, I only want, I want this for me. Is it okay for me to want this for me? Maybe, maybe not, but how can I shift that? Do I need to shift that to being what they want for them, right? What do they want, right? And now if what I want and what they want is different, then maybe we need to, maybe they need to not be with me. Because if I want them to be great and they don't want to be great, then maybe we're not a good fit. And then another one with athlete-centered coach, be developmentally appropriate all times I'll constantly be thinking is this the right place and time for this to happen right now and if it's not when and have a plan make your plan for a time that's right for that player and then also do that with, with if you have children or you know young high performance players do that in collaboration with parents you know, and then when you when you have adults who are highly driven, you know, amazing athletes, then collaborate with them. They ultimately it's their plan that you're helping facilitate. Um, with visual training for tennis, um, you know, realize that that anxiety plays a huge role in how clearly people will see the ball. So. So if you or they uh, can reduce the anxiety level on the court, then there's going to be a lot more clarity. Um, there was a book called The Edge that came out in the 90s, and it was a survey of top athletes. And one thing that they pretty universally agreed upon was that in peak performance states, they felt calm, right? No matter what the circumstance. I mean, even, even though you know, the game was on the line with four seconds left, you know, they still felt calm. Uh, and then realizing that there are skills, there's certain skills to seeing that aren't taught well um, to this day, but they could be, and you can get a big leg up on your competition if you're teaching scanning, tracking, and focusing because then you'll never have to say watch the ball ever again and you'll never have to say keep your eye on the ball because no, neither of those things is a specific skill um and then realizing like you said that there's a lot of junk up there right going on people are using their favorite their favorite modality to try to attack this problem but they might actually have to develop a new modality that's been unused. And then that's really healthy. That's a, a brain plasticity thing. So, so when people can start to operate out of different modalities and start to use more of their brain, then they're gonna live longer and happier and all, all of that. So there you have it. Great. Thank you very much, Bill, for all the clarification and in-depth touching of these topics. Jure, thank you. It's, it was a pleasure to talk to you. Um, I, I guess we're friends now, huh? Yes, we're connected. Okay, awesome. So, I like the term. Time with the. I like the term social media. It's supposed to be social. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Thank you very much. Awesome. Great. Thank you for tuning in. Follow me on being the Genuine Athlete Instagram and Facebook page. Share, like and comment and be genuine all the way. Um, they're already in sort of a anxious state. They're in a... I should have...
turn my phone on. Hold on a second. Don't worry. All right. So Don't there worry. are already things. 